Good afternoon. Welcome to Hanover and to Dartmouth College. Thank you for joining us for this year's parent and family orientation called Partnering for Success. My name is Sylvia Spears, and I am the acting dean of the college. Together with a wonderful group of dedicated colleagues, I'm responsible for shepherding the student affairs departments that ultimately support your sons and daughters in their lives outside of the classroom. Today we have a full program for you um, and that will introduce you to college resources and give you a flavor of the Dartmouth experience. Hopefully also give you some information that will best position you to support your sons and daughters. But before we begin, I am so excited to have this opportunity to introduce to you President Jim Young Kim, the 17th president of Dartmouth College. President Kim is the first physician to serve as Dartmouth's president, and he's also an anthropologist and an expert in global health. President Kim co-founded Partners in Health with Dr. Paul Farmer and others in, eight, in 1987 during their time as students at Harvard Med School. Partners in Health works with impoverished communities in places like Haiti, Peru, Russia, Rwanda, Lesotho, Malawi, and the United States to provide medical care and social services. While working with Partners in Health in Lima, Peru in the mid-1990s, President Kim helped to develop the first large-scale treatment program for multidrug-resistant tuberculosis in a poor, poor country. Such programs now exist in more than 40 nations. From 2004 to 2006, President Kim served as the director of the Department of HIV AIDS at the World Health Organization. In that role, he led the 3 by 5 initiative, which sought to treat 3 million new HIV AIDS patients in developing countries with antiviral drugs by 2005. Launched in September of 2003, the ambitious program ultimately reached its goal in 2007. Before assuming the Dartmouth presidency, President Kim held professorships at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health. He also served as chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School chief of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and director of the Francois Xavier Bagno Center for Health and Human Rights at the Harvard School of Public Health. He has taught undergraduate courses and graduate co courses in anthropology, social analysis, social medicine, and global health. President Kim received a MacArthur Genius Fellowship in 2003. He was named one of America's 25 best leaders by U.S. News and World Report and was one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. In 2004, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine for his professional achievements and his commitment to service. President Kim received the Al Brown Alumni Association Williams Rogers Award for Service to Society in 2008 and an honorary degree from Brown this past year in 2009's commencement. Born in 1959 in Seoul, Korea, President Kim moved his, with his family to the United States at the age of five and grew up in Muscatine, Iowa. His father, a dentist, sought, taught at the University of Iowa where his mother received her PhD in philosophy. He attended Muscatine High School where he was valedictorian and president of his class. He was also quarterback for the football team and a point guard for the basketball team. President Kim graduated with an AB, magna cum laude from Brown University in 1982. He earned an MD from Harvard Medical School in 1991 
and a PhD in anthropology from Harvard University in 1993. He is married to Dr. Jung Suk Lim, a pediatrician. The couple have two young sons, Thomas and baby Nicholas. We are so pleased and proud to have President Kim join us here at Dartmouth College as president and as point guard for the college. Please join me in welcoming President Jim Young Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's so great to see all of you here today. Thank you uh, so much for being here. You know, um, this is a 240-year-old institution, only 16 presidents uh, before me. Now, I, um, uh, I urge you to go to Baker Library. There's a, there's a, a history room in the front uh, foyer of Baker Library where um, there are pictures of all the um, presidents of the past, all 16 previous presidents. You'll see that Eliezer Wheelock, uh, the Reverend uh, Wheelock, uh, was, um, I think he and his son both were wearing uh, white wigs, uh, which given the status of my hair, I might start again as a tradition <laughs> uh, here at Dartmouth. But it's really stunning to think about a 240-year-old institution and uh, the opportunity to uh, be its 17th president. Some interesting things that you might not know is that uh, the, of the previous 16 president, eight were clergy and eight were not. So I break the tie um, <laughs> of clergy uh, persons. This institution was started with a great goal in language that we wouldn't use today, but this institution was founded with a clear social mission to educate the Native Americans and other young people in the area. You know, uh, on Tuesday, uh, President Jim Wright will hand over to me the Monteith Bowl. It's a bowl that's only handled by presidents and, pre and previously only one other person. So it's a tremendous honor and I take so seriously that the trustees, the alums, the students have entrusted with me the presidency. But let me be clear, I take even more seriously that all of you are entrusting your children to us and ultimately to me. It's a great act of faith on your part. And it's also a significantly costly uh, uh, investment <laughs> on your part. Now, let me be um, honest and say that this is a difficult time to be president of a college or university. Uh, everyone is questioning the value proposition of an education at institutions like Dartmouth College. Um, we've had some people tell us, well, I can go to, in fact, one particular person, the University of Oklahoma, for $15,000. Why should I go to Dartmouth College? Uh, for a lot more, as you well know. You know, uh, it's very exciting to be president of Dartmouth College at this time. And to quote um, President Obama, uh, as he was walking into the job, I remember in an interview he said, well, if you're going to do a job, you might as well do it when it counts. It counts now here at Dartmouth College a lot, and it's something that uh, we'll have to work very hard at to get through a difficult economic time. But let me also be clear. I think the value proposition of a Dartmouth College education could never be more clear. You know, I could say the standard things, um, you know, the, the clear differences of a Dartmouth College education compared to our peers. The professors teach classes. The tenure-track professors teach the classes. But even more importantly, they grade the papers. There's a lot of really strong evidence that says that even if you lecture, if you're not grading papers and giving direct feedback to the students about the quality of their thinking and the quality of their writing, they're not going to have as good an experience. That's really clear. Our athletic facilities, as you can see, are really unmatched. The participation of our young people in sports, both intramural and, and varsity, are extremely important. And I happen to be one of the people who believe very strongly that, that being involved with athletics is an important part 
of the educational experience. And while there are a lot of misunderstandings about the social scene here, I spent a lot of time this summer meeting with uh, groups across the campus, including the fraternities. Um, I uh, had dinner at Alpha Delta House, which was the original model for Animal House. And now, you know, I grew up in the 70s, and I have to tell you, I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not what I found at Alpha Delta House. At Alpha Delta last quarter, in the, in the spring quarter, they had the second highest grade point average of uh, all the, the fraternities and sororities on campus. In the Proudy, which is one of our really um, wonderful events where throughout the community and beyond, we raise money for uh, the Norris Cotton Cancer Center. Um, out of the 30 or so young men who are here this summer, 25 of them rode and raised money for cancer care in the Proudy. So here are the descendants of Animal House with among the highest grade point averages, doing tremendous amounts of social service. And um, for, for all of the parents who are wondering, you know, the sine qua non of a Greek system in other uh, universities and colleges is exclusivity. You get to party with the people that you want to party with and you can exclude others. At Dartmouth, even the hapless freshman male get into any party they want to go to. <laughs> right? So the social scene here is, is not what people think. Uh, it's, you know, as an anthropologist, I was watching and I've been, I've been studying carefully um, the, not only the Greek system, but other organizations, the Ledyard Canoe Club. There's so many wonderful organizations, the Asian American students, Latino students, and um, whereas some people would say, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's too contrived. Actually, I don't think so. You know, every culture that I've ever been in tries to get a small group of 20 or 30 or 40 young people in situations where they share the most intimate details of their lives, share their struggles with some project like being a Dartmouth College student, and build relationships and friendships that not only do they keep for the rest of their lives, but it sustains them. Turns out that a lot of medical research is now saying that having close friends you've made when you're young and keeping them into your adulthood is actually protective in many ways in terms of your long-term health. So the friendships that people make here are very special. You know, across the spectrum of, of uh, political view, of, of, uh, of uh, profession, of uh, uh, orientation in so many different directions, I find Dartmouth alums who just love this place. I try to, I, I, I do a little trick. I, I, I ask myself, okay, how long will it take me to get this Dartmouth alum to tear up talking about Dartmouth? <laughs> um, it, it's usually like five minutes. <laughs> and I believe that it's because there is a quality to the life here that unfortunately they don't find often after they leave here. So I've been now um, studying this place very carefully and trying to read about the previous presidents, what they've done, um, trying to understand uh, what is the character of this place called Dartmouth College that leads to so many alums tearing up about their college. Now, you know, just to be honest, I don't wanna, I don't wanna insult anybody but I've known a lot of Harvard people who cry, but it's usually while they're taking classes at Harvard. <laughs> so so, so I'm tr I've been trying to understand what makes this place so special, and it gets right to the question of the value proposition for Dartmouth education. So I went back to a book that is the record of the inauguration of John Sloan Dickey one of the great presidents in Dartmouth history in 1945. And his predecessor, Ernest Martin Hopkins, uh, uh, was giving a very, uh, a wonderful speech. Just to give you a sense of the historical continuity and where I sit in the history of this institution, he wrote about a man named Judge David Cross. And he writes, this is, this is Ernest Martin Hopkins, who was president for 29 years up until 1945. He writes, in his 95th year, Judge David Cross came and made one of the most eloquent addresses that I have ever heard on a commencement occasion. Bespeaking his respect and sense of importance which attached to the college and his affection for it, it was my good fortune as clerk in the president's office, this was President Tucker's office, later to be delegated to take him to the train. 
And on my way down, he turned and put his arm across my shoulders and said, son, I graduated in 1841. I have known a member of every class that ever graduated from Dartmouth. And it was entirely possible for me to have known every graduate of Dartmouth College. You are young, and you're going to be associated with the college for a long time. And I should like to have you, in your later years, say to men that you had known a man who knew a man in every class that had graduated from Dartmouth. I had lunch the other day with, uh, Hal, with Hal Ripley. We have something here called the Hal Ripley Society. Hal graduated in 1929 from Dartmouth College and has given to the college every year since he graduated. So all the new graduates, we make them members of the Hal Ripley Society, anyone who's given any money, and say that membership in the Hal Ripley Society is, is yours to lose. Hal's 100 years old, and I sent a message to him saying that I'd like to go and see him. But he said no, he'd like to come to the office, because he'd been in the office with every president since Ernest Martin Hopkins. We had a wonderful talk. So there are exactly two degrees of separation between me and, the, and a member of every graduating class at Dartmouth College. <laughs> I know a man who knew a man who knew a man from every class of Dartmouth College. <clears throat> So in this, uh, in, in, in this address, there are some hints as to why this is such a special place. Ernest Martin Hopkins also writes, I have become impressed more and more with the sweetness that attached to the relationship between one and another which constituted this great family which we call Dartmouth. Sweetness. He doesn't use this kind of informal language in any other part of this address, a sweetness. Now, um, there's a very well-known writer, former senior editor of the Atlantic Monthly, whom I had lunch with just today. And um, I asked him to have lunch because I'd been hearing him on, uh, on uh, National Public Radio for years and had read his books. And um, when I invited him by email, he sent me a letter. And he was telling me how lucky I am to be here at Dartmouth. He writes, I taught a senior writing class here last fall. I stress senior because all the students had had four years of Dartmouth socialization. The class was built around collective critiques of student short stories. The students all wrote well, a few wonderfully. Now let me add a little comment here. Seniors at Dartmouth College who fancy themselves as creative writers are probably the most hypercritical and at the once uh, thin-skinned people on the face of the earth, right? <laughs> He feared the worst. But what impressed me more than their talent, he writes, was their decency. I feared hurt feelings, bruised egos, two critical critiques. Instead, they managed the social miracle of being at once honest and empathic in their comments. They cushioned criticism and respect, even affection. I told them how humanly rare that kind of communication was. I checked my experience against a friend of mine who teaches political science here. This is Dartmouth. In over 40 years of teaching in a half dozen universities, both here and abroad, he told me he had never had students who treated each other so well. That speaks volumes of good about the Dartmouth community. You are lucky to be able to draw on such a reservoir of community feeling. There's no way right now, easily, to measure that in monetary terms. There's no way for me to convince you that this is uh, worth the money that you're spending to send your children here to Dartmouth College. I was just up at the Ravine Lodge last night, and um, I was told that this was a very important event. I was given some clues as to what I would see. Um, and some of you may have heard about it already. Um, but what I saw was a sweetness that attached to the relationship among people who'd known each other for three days among the, the class of 2013. But I saw an intense sweetness in the volunteer work of the sophomores, juniors, and seniors who'd spent a month of their lives just to welcome the first year students. I've never seen that before. They had songs about salad, songs about lasagna, <laughs> just 
so that we would enjoy our meal a little bit more. They made complete fools of themselves. Uh, in a, with, with a variety that was stunning to me. I didn't know you could make a fool of yourself in so many different ways. Uh, <laughs> but they did it. They did it because they experienced it themselves. This has been going on at least since 1935. If we believe Ernest Martin Hopkins, it's been going on at least since the late 1800s. And I believe that the sweetness that attaches to the relationship one to another leads to trust, leads to confidence in working in teams, leads to a sense of how social systems work, leads to better learning, and ultimately leads people in a direction that will allow them to garner their personal resources, but also to work effectively enough with others so that they can change the world. I step back from my own career of trying to solve uh, the most difficult problems in the world. Because I truly believe that a place like Dartmouth College, and perhaps only Dartmouth College, can build on this foundation of sweetness and concern and community in a way that will create a group of leaders the likes of which no one has ever seen before. That's your children. Thank you for entrusting them to me. You know, the, the, the 13s will always be very special to me. They are the ones who came in with me. In four years, they'll be my first graduating class. For the rest of the history of Dartmouth College, they will be my first class, and they will be very, very close to my heart. Thank you for entrusting them to me. I can guarantee you that we'll do our utmost to get them out of this experience so revved up and charged up that you're not going to recognize them, and you're going to be amazed at what they do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.